this is somewhat special uh, for me personally on, on a couple of counts, and I'll go to them in a minute. But um, on a larger note, before we start, our, our, our um, first, our grateful thanks to the folks from Goodwin. I see Courtney is on to today. So welcome, Courtney. And um, Goodwin has been a great partner um, all through all through through the past year, particularly encouraging and helping us grow, participating, hosting events, and such. And um, thank you once again um, for today's session. And um, and then the, the other reason for me, well, reason for me this is a special is because I have a friend and a colleague, and I've not been able to say that um, in quite some time, who is participating in this session with me. So Karen Manella is um, a fellow PwC um, staffer or employee. Um, and um, I was very excited to get Karen I'll have her speak to her, her background and experience um, in a minute, and, and all of you will share and understand why I'm excited. Um, this particular session came to us, a conversation around ethics and fintech came to us about a year ago, I would say, when we, when we all heard in the news the story about a very young investor in Robinhood who misread the information about his investment, and um, as a result of it, uh, unfortunately, decided to kill himself, and and that caused ripples across industry in many ways because this is not what new technology is supposed to be supposed to facilitate, help, and grow. So the question of ethics, um, we frequently talk about regulation, and I see Tracy is on the phone, who's been one of our previous speakers on regulations. We very frequently talk about regulations. But in a in a in a young and growing vertical like fintech, in fact, any of the new technology, when regulation has yet to meet and put those guardrails around technology being developed and consumers, how does how how should we think about it? Whether we are consumers, business people, and such. So the conversation around ethics and fintech may seem esoteric, but it's so much front, right, and center. So having this conversation, again, is, is somewhat personal um, at many levels as well. So I'm pleased to have, um, and I'm going to say this again, a friend and a colleague um, join me. Um, and before, Karen, I give this to you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, a, a note, because both of us are from PwC, and as an audit firm, there are a number of restrictions. So just to say very clearly at the front um, and top of our call, the opinions, ideas um, expressed today are our own and do not reflect anything, um, any any ideas or suggestions from our employer. So with that um, formal note, Karen, why don't I give it to you to tell us about yourself? Sure. <clears throat> sure. Thank you, Jagathy. Um, it's just a real pleasure to be invited to talk with you all. And um, it's just, you know, wonderful to Jagatha and I were talking about this topic, and uh, you can tell how passionate um, she is about uh, this organization and, and the topic that we're talking today. So um, very happy to be here. Um, a little bit about myself. She's um, well, uh, again, I'll iterate what Jagathy said about PwC. These are all my opinions. None shall be contributed to PwC whatsoever. They're all personal, <laughs> so I'll lay that out there as well. Um, but my background, actually, the majority of, of my career um, was um, with the government. So, um, you know, I, the, the background that I really bring, I spent almost two decades um, with the Department of Justice, um, the FBI in particular, and the General Counsel's Office. Um, but prior to that, I actually, you know, did a stint uh, at Goldman Sachs where, I had worked for a couple of years as an analyst. And when I started with the beer, actually, I did a lot of um, focus on terrorism financing. So a lot of that financial mm -hmm. aspect as well. Um, and, you know, I focused primarily in national security, um, technology and financial aspects when I was at the FBI um, and then joined a startup um, as their general counsel. And now I'm at PwC. Um, in the role of governance, privacy, and ethics. Um, and all of that, you know, has a deep root in obviously looking at laws, regulations, and policies, 
but also, you know, looking at ethics um, intertwined within um, and especially the private sector and uh, what they, you know, whether the private sector should just follow the law or whether they should go beyond that and look at ethics. But I, I know I, you just asked me to introduce myself, Jagathy, and I'm getting ahead of myself. So I will turn it back to you. That's a very broad overview of my background. Um, and so, and, and again, I'm, I'm happy to be here to talk with you all. And welcome formally. Um, <laughs> and, and I, think, I think everything about your background is what makes, uh, or what is going to make the next 40 minutes that we have so, so very interesting. And there's something that I picked up as you were describing your experience. Like um, Debbie said a few minutes ago, she comes from a different perspective and you bring this broader than financial services perspective. So I think it would be good um, if you don't mind as we talk that you bring in all of that experience and say, how are um, industries perhaps thinking of ethics as, as consumer data, consumer information becomes so much a currency with organizations? Um, and as we said before, regulations are not here yet um, to match up. Um, how are perhaps other industries looking at it too? Um, so that would be really good to, that perspective will be really useful to get from you as well. And, and maybe I kind of go along the same lines um, to ask the first question. Could you describe what ethics in business means? I know you mentioned a flavor of self-regulations when you and I were talking yesterday. But what does it mean? And recognizing it's a broad question, <laughs> you have it. It's like that. That's <laughs> so. Did you have a couple hours? No. <laughs> yeah. um, so obviously, please, you know, chime in too. I'd love to hear what the audience thinks about that question. But um, I'm going to narrow it a little bit um, with regard to new technologies. I think because that's really where. I think there's an intersection of not just fintech, but a multitude of the different sectors. Yep. Um, and, and look at, you know, what is a private company's responsibility with regard to what they're implementing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's how I'd like to phrase it, right? What, what is their responsibility? And then what is it that they should do? And I think the, the ethics part is what should they do, right? Mm. The regulation is what am I required to do? Right. And the ethics is what should I do? So, so that's, that's number one. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, emerging technologies and, you know, that's the great unknown. There's a lot of things that companies want to do to become more efficient. Right, the fastest to market, the most consumer friendly, all very important things, right, for the private sector and for your product and your business. But I think it's important to take a pause and take a step back and make sure that there's not some, um, what's the word I'm looking for, some un consequence, unforeseen consequence. Mm. Right. So, mm. and, and we can talk further, but um, you know, there's a lot of algorithms being used. Um, there's a lot of things to make things run smoother or maybe less of the human touch is another yeah. way to look at it. And yeah. what are the ripple effects, right? What are the potential consequences of that? There, it, it's important to kind of look at it from very different perspectives and not just the drive to market, like yeah. the, the most efficient drive to market. I don't know. Yeah. If that, does that answer your question, Jagatha? I mean, I can expound on and on, but <laughs> no, actually, it does. And and you made a point there, which ties in with the question we just got from um, Tracy, saying, "So Tracy is asking the question: Can any company, private or public, be held responsible for someone's mental illness?" And I want to expand that question before you respond to what you just said. There's so many algorithms being used, so the human touch is removed. So it's almost um, can somebody take that hat take can 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 a company can leadership take a hands off approach to saying it's not my fault that X happened because of mental illness or an algorithm misfunctioning or such. Well, so I, I think there's actually two parts to right what you just mentioned, right? So okay. I'll address the algorithm first, and then I absolutely want to address uh, Tracy's question as well. I, I think what's interesting about algorithms. Um, and many of you may already know this that are, that are 
you know, part of this uh, discussion, but you have to be very careful, right? There, the, if you have to look at the data you're using, right? Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that the data you're using is not biased. And how do you make the determination that your data is not biased, right? So that's one. And then that the sample is not biased. So even if the data in itself is not a biased data, the sample you're using is not biased, right? Mm. Because if you build on that, you, you, while you think you're doing this hands-off approach, right? And you're, it's not going to be biased because you have an algorithm looking at everything, but the effect of it really is that you're discriminating in some manner. Right. Um, and so, and then on top of that, right? I agree with you in something that you had just just said, which is when you're not the one, you may have heard this example before with banks, right? You used to go in, you met somebody, you asked for a mortgage, right? The person said, you have the mortgage, you don't have the mortgage. I'm obviously right. simplifying this greatly here. But, but now, right? What happens a lot of times at the banks? You're not having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. It's more a matter of it spits out a score, mm -hmm. and the score tells you whether you qualify for a loan or a mortgage. Right. And does that, and, and not to say that's a bad thing, right? I'm not saying it's a negative thing, but stop and think the person that is now removed, right? It's not them making the decision, which mm -hmm. could be good, right? Because a lot of decisions in the past were made based on certain bias tendencies. So that could be a good thing. But you also have to look at it, could it be a bad thing because that personal interaction has been removed? And if the data and the algorithm is based on bias information, right? Now the person doesn't even have a responsibility to look into it. It's not mm -hmm. them, it's the algorithm. So I think that's where you really need, it's very important that internally, right, the company is evaluating and consistently looking at these type of issues and the potential, you know, uh, effects. Um, and, and then I'll and pause there. And go ahead. Yeah, that's great. In fact, if you, if you could jump into mental illness and then I'll, I'll read yeah. out Ken's question for everybody. Sure. Um, so, I mean, the question is, could they legally be, are you asking Tracy, could they legally be held responsible or are they ethically responsible? Because I think those are two very distinct, right? Very distinct issues. So no, not legally. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's a great question, Tracy. I mean, I do, I do put, and this is again, personally, right? I do feel that there are certain things, right? That you have to watch for it depending on the company, but if we stay in the financial sector, right? Um, if certain decisions are constantly being made based on a very narrow or biased interpretation, that could potentially lead, right, to someone's demise. I mean, I'm being very, you know, grander here with that word, but I mean, if somebody keeps on asking for credit um, and it keeps getting denied because it's based on, you know, certain race or certain factors uh, based on that, that are built into the system, right? So the credit keeps on getting denied. Jobs is a fact. Your credit score gets, I mean, it's a whole ripple effect. And I do think, right, that can have an effect on someone's mental well-being. Um, so, yes, I do think that everyone has a responsibility, but it's an ethical one, right? Um, and you hope that that ethics kind of gets built in to the mission of the company. And one of the ways I think that it can be done, and in a way it's kind of removing ethics a little bit, but you know, ethics in itself is also a marketable quality. Mm. If your company is ethical mm. for however you define that, right? That's a market advantage. It should be a market advantage. And I think a lot of consumers would perceive that as a market advantage. So I think it's not necessarily an impossible sell, right, to a company to have certain principles and ethical principles intertwined with how they run their business. That's a, that is so interesting because on one hand, we all want to believe in the humanity and the goodness and richness of humanity. <laughs> and then we say, well, this good business sense to you make money if you behave ethically. 
Um, and that actually leads very well to Ken's um, question that he posted. And I'm going to read that out for everybody. Do you feel that business is more or less ethical these days? And if not, is this is the issue that people do not understand what it means or are disregarding the discipline? That that's a great that's a fantastic <laughs> question. Um, well, hold on, we, let's ask Ken what he thinks. Ken, Ken, what do you think? Yeah. What Karen? Um, you know, actually, in my intro to fintech class, I have a session on ethics. And the question I pose to the class is, uh, do you think fintech companies are more ethical than the legacy banks? And it's usually split. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, you know, there's plenty of issues with legacy banks like Wells Fargo creating accounts that don't exist, right? Yeah. But fintechs like with Robinhood and, you know, it's, right. it's a mixed bag, I think. I think the thought is that Fintech companies are usually younger people and they're going to do things differently and it's going to be better. And it's, but, you know, my observation is that ethics are being, there's a less, people are not as ethical as they used to be. And companies, I do not believe that they are. And I think, you know, I'm not a big regulator type person, but I think you need the regulators to make sure people are in compliance. And um, I think ethical is something that's in the person. And you certainly need people as CEOs and the rest of them to really believe in it, not do it because they have to, but they believe it. But I think ethics are weaker in this country than they have been in a long time. It just feels that way to me. Um, I don't know what the group thinks. I, if I can comment, uh, this is Debbie. Um, I think that um, I, I, I think I agree with you, Ken. And I, part of the way I'm seeing evidence is the whole issue of how people are responding to COVID and and this shift between I want to have safe practices and even get vaccinated because that's for the common good versus my own sense of personal freedom. And that's a documented shift in the last 20 years or so, certainly in the last 40 years. The other thing I think relative to companies, certainly I've sat in enough meetings in large companies over decades when something's under discussion and somebody says, now, wait a minute, we got into trouble with that five years ago, or here's our history or something, you know, the, 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 the wise elders, whether they're old or not, they, they've got a different perspective and experience that they bring to these conversations. And what I've um, observed certainly at distance in small startups as often as that role just isn't there. And when I think about um, raising the price of insulin, raising the price of, um, what's the other thing, the asthma inhalers or yeah. epinephrine Ep or whatever, Epi or maybe both. Yep, the EpiPens. Epi -pens. I mean, there's nothing ethical there and there was nobody to stop them. I also think about my two favorite companies to complain about, Uber and Airbnb. Again, nobody to stop them. And so they didn't really care that they might be breaking local laws or regulations because they were, as you were saying, Karen, before they were rushing to market and they were establishing themselves in the market. And, uh, you know, Airbnb certainly has wrecked havoc in um, towns because it's just sopped up all the housing that's anywhere near affordable. But anyway, I, I think there's a shift. I think that, that's so the that's core of what I was saying. So De De Debbie and Ken, thank you for chiming in because there's a very inter interesting and strong perspective that so there's a next question that came in, which which um, Ken, which Irka asks, can ethics be thought? Um, and I guess this is where it, it becomes, Karen, why did I flip that to you? What do you think? Can <laughs> ethics, given your extensive career with the government particularly? So... <laughs> It's interesting. Um, it's can it be taught? I mean, I I think ethics is taught in our society every day, right? And I think what Debbie and Ken were talking about is definitely a visible shift. I think in our society, 
Um, I think it's definitely was pronounced in the past year and a half, mm -hmm. um, even more so. Um, so I think, you know, ethics, yes, can be taught. Um, do, do I think it can change someone who is completely unethical to become an ethical person? No, I, I, I think that um, there are, you know, ethics are to some degree, and this is my, you know, my lawyer side coming in here, but to some degree, right, it's, um, it's embodied within our laws, right, and the regulations, and so, you know, the, the ethics are, in my opinion, the, the, let me step back. The regulations should be the guardrails of our ethics. Mm -hmm. And it, and, and we, the, the people who are, you know, whether it's through government or whether through it's the private sector, right? We should be hopefully leading the charge to say that we are doing things even better than what the regulations are requiring. Um, but, Unfortunately, in my opinion, um, really the drive to be more ethical than, let's say, the regulations, it has to come from the people. Okay. So if there's a drive, right, for the people to want it, the businesses will respond. And, and I feel like that is what we ha that I have seen, right? Um, like even if you were to go back to, and I, I, I know this is a little outside the wheelhouse here, but you know, if you go back to the government and privacy and Snowden, and I'm not going to get into that whole discussion here, but at that point, right, there was a huge, huge shift of what the public was expecting of the government, right? A certain additional privacies. It's the same thing in my mind, of what I see with regard to ethics, right? There are certain guardrails. And if the public starts demanding that we want a certain response, I do feel that the businesses are listening because mm -hmm. that's their product base. So I don't know if the drive necessarily, Debbie and Ken, what you're saying is the ethical part of the business or if it's the market, right? But I think that um, th th there's more and more businesses that are incorporating, right, the ESG, that ethical kind of societal um, process into the decision making. Um, but again, like Debbie, I, I definitely agree with you. The startups, right? They're just so hungry to establish themselves that I do think that sometimes, um, unless they're established on the ethical, right? There are a lot of startups where their basis is the ethical base. So I know I kind of swayed a little bit and kind of, <laughs> but, but, but you, you brought, you brought some really good points because the double bottom line is a real thing or triple bottom line, depending on who you right. speak to it. And then folks like um, your um, previous employer, Goldman Sachs are, are actively monitoring the mar market for e on ESG factors and ethical behavior. And our last month's session, we kind of had, we had a focus on ESG and one of the speakers um, then said, that uh, the millennials particularly are driving certain behaviors. And in the same context, perhaps the notion of what is ethical driven by consumer behavior has changed over the generations yeah. as well. Um, so to let, staying with that, in fact, not staying with that, I'm actually moving to another question. This might be closer to some of the work you have done um, with the government. Carolyn asks the question, from an engineer product development perspective, with the pressures of trying to get code to production, products to market, who's accountable for the ethics piece? And where is that thinking, if any, um, inserted into the technology development process? Um, so I think it, it depends on the company. I mean, I think it varies from company to company, quite honestly. I mean, I could just speak from my personal experience. Um, I, I do think that there are companies trying to put that accountability and that ethics piece in there. Um, but I think it's not necessarily on the coder to have that answer, but for someone within the process to ask the questions, right? So it's the engineer, the product developer may not see, right, the, the issue with their code, for example. Um, but I think that 
I just want to make sure I have the, the question. I mean, who's ultimately accountable? It's the entire company. It's not just the engineer. It's everyone who touches that product, right? It's, it's a joint effort. Um, and in my experience, right, it's, these are the questions that we're asking in product development. These are the questions like, have you considered the ethics of something? Is this something we want to even take to market? Is this something that we want our company to be associated with? Right. So that's the first like baseline ethical question. And then you're, you know, you're asking like, are things accessible? Are things have privacy built, you know, in mind? Because, but again, it, it depends on the mission of the company. And if it's important to the company that they are seen as an ethical, you know, privacy centric, that will be injected throughout the process. But, you know, I, I don't see this as it's the engineer should be the one held accountable. It's, it's the company and it's everyone in the build process all the way through market. So. And Carolyn, did you have a thought on that? Yeah, I did. Just to follow up. Hey, Karen, uh, this Hi. is. Thank you. Um, I think it might go to the prior question about can it be taught? So, oh. you know, a little bit on that, can it be taught? I think yeah. it can, but I also think are there tools that could be um, implemented to make sure it's accounted for, right? I know it seems a little bit checklisty and processy, but is there anything that we can do from that? standpoint to make sure, yes, we've checked it and we've thought about this. I don't know if it's as simple as that, but. No, it's, it's a great, I mean, it's a great perspective. And actually that's, that's part of what I do. <laughs> that's like, you're calling out part of what my job is. So um, it's having the engineers and the build team and those that are coming up with the ideas to think of those particular issues, right? Because, you know, as you're right, as you're focused on getting something to market and you're so concentrating on that particular aspect, um, you want to insert that thinking. And, and yes, there's app kits and tools and checklists and consultations. All of that gets, um, gets the entire team thinking in that regard as they build. Does, does that answer your question, Carolyn? Or? Yeah, it does. I think you said you hit on it. There are tools. There's tools. Well, they're being developed. <laughs> there are things that were right. I mean, like the basic, basic tool, Carolyn, is to have that conversation, right? It's the, the change management part of it. It's the education, right? That's the ground level. You have to kind of awaken somebody outside of what their focus is, right? There are all these other things that you need to be aware of outside of what your specialty is, exactly. right? It is kind of, in my mind, everyone's responsibility to be thinking about it, but mm -hmm. it's the company's responsibility, right? The employer to educate the people to think about it. They don't even necessarily have to agree with it. They have to be aware that these are important factors to consider during builds, right? During market, the whole thing. So, yeah, I mean, I think, and then we're always trying to find ways to, to automate and to make it more um, easy for the person to, to understand and, and use those, those points. I think it's, um, it's interesting because um, it comes back to the culture of an organization then, right? It's like, are you culturally at a place? And, and is leadership ready to drive a culture that is ethical um, in, in everything we do? Um, and so, by the way, folks, um, all of these questions we're throwing at Karen are not that what Karen and I prepared. So I want to give <laughs> a lot of kudos to Karen for being a good sport about these questions coming in. But clearly, this is the topic top of mind and, and the questions are, are coming in. Um, I, I do want to add something, Jagathy, based yeah. on what we just talked about, you know, comparing like my experience within the government, um, you know, I, I started doing national security law in its infancy. I mean, not infancy like church and pike commissions in the 70s, but I'm not I'm older, but not that old. But, um, <laughs> you know, but uh, but looking around like 9-11, right, there was a huge shift in the laws um and so what I say in the infancy of, of the, the modern national security laws, I kind of started uh, around the 9-11 time frame. And so you can see how there's a pendulum swing. And then there's also, though, 
what I've seen is a lot of the regulations, especially around like national security law and criminal law, um, it's, it, it's, it's trying to build the ethics into the law. It's much heavier and the compliance is much heavier than, um, than the private sector per se. And what I'm seeing in the private sector is a lot of people really trying to do the right thing. And, 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 and Debbie and Ken, you bring up really great points. And I do agree overall that there has been a shift from the society, but I do feel also, and maybe it's the larger companies and not as much in the, the startups, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I do feel that there is a, a real push, um, to kind of intertwine the ethics. Um, into the business and the decision-making process. Um, For what it's worth, that's, again, just my personal experience looking at the various um, areas that I've I've worked. Yeah, I think that's interesting because one of the conversations we had planned in our planned conversation talk is um, is, is actually the intersection of both um, corporations and regulators and how can regulators provide guidance to innovation and I'm jumping there because of everything you said. You know, it's it's there is a shift in how regulations are driving ethical behavior. And then one aspect of this you and I wanted to talk about is the impact of regulations and ethical behavior behavior on innovation because that drives back. If we if we strip away um, for a minute uh, and keep to the side what Debbie mentioned about Airbnb and Uber and their practices, the concept of innovation. And I'm sure there's somebody somewhere arguing, hey, if you had watched all of this, we could never have innovated. Um, clearly, this group does not agree with all of those practices. But um, could you talk a little bit on, on that kind of connection between regulation, ethics, and innovation? Well, I think for a long time, the companies didn't want the regulations, quite honestly. I mean, if you look at like the big tech companies, for example, right. I think that they, you know, were happy to 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 delve into the space unregulated. I think as they're seeing that it's harder and harder to swim in that space, mm. um, they're actually now looking, right, to be regulated um, mm. so that they can point and say, I'm following a law. And I'm looking at Laura's uh, question about is following the law ethical enough? You know, um, it, it's... Uh, and I apologize, Dr. What was the actual question that? The, the question I was trying to draw the connection between regulation, ethics, and innovation. Oh yeah, so I I, I do think. Um, listen, there's 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 a good balance between, and it's a hard one, but there's a balance right between the um, having broad principles like what I like to call the guardrails. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like that if the regulations are broad enough that there are guardrails, um, that should not stop innovation. Of course, mm-hmm. the flip side is if you have guardrails, it's harder to enforce. Um, you know, it's not specific enough. But I, I do think that you need to have a broad kind of guardrail regulation approach, especially because in the tech side of things, right? Things are so fast in development and evolving so quickly. And so you need the kind of the broad brushstrokes of regulations, mm-hmm. but not the, um, not the very detailed, um, compliance structure. Cause I do believe when it's too detailed, you will, or too, um, specific, um, you potentially would hamper, I think, innovation. I, I think um, that's a that's a it like you said I think right at the start and I'm paraphrasing there is no right answer to this because it's it's so much um, an independent organization's um, perhaps view of themselves um, how do they perceive themselves to be and which side of this ethical um, uh, ethical point do they stand um, and how much do they want to be regulated uh, how much do they want to follow regulations but. Even as I'm saying this, a thought comes to mind because a lot of these, when innovation happens, we are not naturally thinking five, 10, 12 years, let's believe that the innovation sticks, what happens then? And I, and I wonder if there are examples, and I maybe even open this out to all of our audience if there are examples, because the one that comes to mind for me is not related to financial services at all. It's, I was thinking about chemistry for a second. 
chemistry is great. You know, it's done a lot of good for humanity, but it's also given us gunpowder. So what? So is, is anybody thinking um, or can, um, given that we have seen several cycles of innovation in technology and several cycles of innovation, at the intersection of financial services and, and technology even, can there be any rules that companies build for themselves and in thinking much ahead, assuming the success of the innovation? Are you opening this up to everyone? I am opening this up to everybody to give you a chance to think. And maybe in the meantime, Ikra, um, what is the Holy Holy Land Holy Land um, case? And I wonder if that ties in with all of this. Oh, so it's it's about the Holy Land Foundation. Um, it doesn't necessarily relate to fin and tech. So happy to have that conversation offline. Um, but it's it's an interesting case. I was reading a book on it, and it was raising a lot of ethical questions. <laughs> so it's like, okay, but it's also a book. So it's like, you, you don't know, you know, you don't know. So I was just curious to hear um, Karen's thoughts on it or if she had any insight into it, but that was. So <laughs> I'd be happy to talk with you offline um, okay. or another time, but um, yeah, no, I, I'm very familiar with that case actually. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was just curious to get a different perspective on it or more perspectives. So may I ask who the, who's the, the viewpoint? What's the book that you've read? It was the injustice one. So I like, you know, it was just one of the, I don't remember, honestly. I just remember reading the case and just being outraged. I was like, this is, this, but it's, it's okay. We don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk with you. Yeah. Cause that could be a whole nother, a whole nother discussion, but oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> is this the Holy Land Park complex? Um, I'm just going to drop that for everybody's benefit into our chat. And you can tell us if this is the right one. It was an organization. There was a trial against the Holy Land Foundation in, in Texas. Oh, so uh, this is not the I'm one. Presuming, okay. I'm presuming that's that's the one. It was a um, nonprofit um, okay. that the government, the government um, sued them for terrorism financing. Got it. Okay. So this is what I found online in my quick search is something completely different. So I'll leave it to the side. Um, <laughs> So, so then, um, so you spoke about regulations, and I think perhaps um, as we're coming to um, the end, and, and still questions, please um, drop your questions if you have any. But I, I, we have two areas that we had planned to cover, and I want to touch one of them. So, given all of this, and, and our initial question was to really discuss what is the legacy or current relationship between um, regulation and ethics, and we kind of have touched on that through the course. But if you were trying to bring that all together and say, um, particularly because of a point you made earlier saying where governmental agencies are going, ethics is being built into how they function and private sector has not yet caught up with that. So overarchingly, where do you see um, that, that relationship between regulations and ethics, particularly in the newer industries or newer technology driven industries where Regulation is three steps behind um, where it needs to be. Well, I first will make a point that I think the difference um, with the government, right, is that a lot of the regulations and a lot of the laws, right, that, that I worked with had to do with the potential of the government, right, taking away someone's powers, Right, someone's movement, someone's right, especially the criminal laws, the national security laws, and even some of the other regulatory laws, right? Um, huge effects on someone's financial well being. So, because of that, I think it there, there might be a little more pause or thought into building in certain regulations and guardrails within those particular laws. Um, in, in the private sector, I think it goes again. I think for newer technologies, um, I do think there is a place to regulate them. Um, and and I, actually, it, it's very interesting. I mean, if you look at the, again, the big tech companies, they're actually, or even let's say in the, the realm of privacy laws, right? Mm -hmm. They're actually urging for federal privacy laws. 
Right. So there, there's a want, and I think it's because they're finding it too difficult to navigate themselves. Um, and they're being pointed out as being unethical in their practices. And so now they're, they're right. So this is a sea change. Now they're turning and looking to the government saying, we want to be regulated, right? We want you to help us tell us how we should swim, what our swim lanes should be. Um, so I, I do think we should use that as the lesson, right? I, I, I mean, I know, again, there has no federal privacy law yet, but I, I do feel like we should look at that use case um, as the lesson for specific guardrails and ethics with regard to new technologies. And there are broad, and, and it's happening, you're seeing it, right? There are proposals out there about how you have to be transparent, right? When you're using an algorithm, some of the laws out there are that there should be transparency as to what goes in to decision-making processes, right? So I think that there, um, there, there does there does need to be a regulation. And, and Jack, is that answering your question? I, it, it, does, it, um, it, it does, but I want to extend it for um, a minute to what's happening globally, because I know early on when you and I spoke, we spoke about how, Globally, different other countries, other regions are treating regula regulations, for instance, around privacy so much more differently than the U.S. And what impact that may have for businesses here? I mean, well, in the privacy realm, right, there's certain decisions that have been made uh, recently that affect the transfer of data from country to country based on, you know, certain decisions and opinions that have come out about whether the U.S. is handling, for example, someone's data appropriately. Yeah. Um, and, and because of that determination, there's been, you know, you have to look, it has a huge effect on, um, on the private sector and how they transfer data from, from country to country. Um, so, you know, I, I think what's difficult is trying to take um, the, the politics mm -hmm. out of the regulations, right? And trying right. to, and making sure, and that your ethics is someone else's ethics, right? I think that's the, the hardest part. But I, I do feel that if you keep it at a high enough level, it can transcend, you know, countries. Yeah. Um, there's certain, I think, basic principles that we've all agreed upon, right? That are important to all of us, right? There, you don't want decisions made that are biased, but of course there's a difference between what our country would consider bias versus another country, right? And I think the other thing we have to look at again is that the traditional ideas of bias need to be challenged, mm -hmm. right? We have protected categories of people and information, but that doesn't extend to the types of bias that's out there, that's potentially out there. I mean, so those, those are the type of things that I think we really need to look at when we're building laws, right, and regulations, but then also as we're building products within our company, you know, a private yeah. sector company or, or a company overseas. Um, and then it, it does, you know, present significant challenges. You want to sell a product overseas, right? Um, there's certain things that you've considered in that product that may be different than what they hold important. And they need to evaluate that product and make sure it lives up to their ethical and their privacy standards. Just like we need to do that when we buy a product, right, outside the U.S. Right. Is it going to do what we want it to do from an ethical, has it, did they have these ethical considerations when they built this product and, and the end effect of the use of the product? So. Yeah, and, I, and I'm, as I'm hearing you speak, the transparency available right now in how ethical a company anywhere in the world is is so much higher than before. Um, yeah, the sweatshops, for instance, came to light, what, 20, 30 years after they were actually happening in some of the, so, some of the countries outside of the U.S., as an example. But that transparency levels, again, because of technology, is so much more um, current and immediate. And therefore, I think the ability to evaluate will be higher now. Um, maybe we have time for um, addressing the last question, but Ikra, you probably have to tell us what is the global corporate tax? Karen, are you familiar with the proposed global corporate tax? 
Um, not so much. I mean, I've heard it in different, mm-hmm. different aspects. Yeah, yeah. I just heard there was um, a proposed global tax of about 15% mm-hmm. um, that they were mandating or considering mandating. I mean, this is in advance of like the G20 and some of the other stuff, but I was wondering if you guys had any insights into that. But I mean, I feel like tax is a whole nother <laughs> conversation. You're probably going to make us have a session on tax now because you're right. I've- um, Especially if something is global, there is um, uh, there is definitely a lot of attention to that. Um, I was about to say that sounds like a wonderful topic for for another session. That, <laughs> but I'd love to will, attend. <laughs> yeah, wait, so you're going to be on the invite list for that, and we'll plan to us that. Um, but we're pretty nearly to closing time. We're about three minutes out. Um, I'll just take a second to see if anybody has any other question for Karen. Um, no, so I, I want to do two things in closing. One, um, this has probably been the most liveliest of sessions in a while. So thank you to all our audience um, for participating. Ken, Debbie, jumping in, Carolyn. Um, it really made this a, a very interactive session. So appreciate all of it. You folks know that anybody here is um, ready to talk to you. So feel free to connect on LinkedIn and um, speak to them directly if you would like. And Karen, once again, you were tremendous sport. Um, the questions went all over the place. You were fantastic in picking it up and bringing it all together. So thank you. I've, I've really enjoyed this. And, um, you know, I want to re- repeat what Jagatha said, that if you have, you know, other questions, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, but I, I've very much enjoyed this conversation. And thank you for inviting me to talk with you and this great organization. So. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And Tracy, thank you for keeping us honest through all of this and and, um, managing behind the scenes um, as we spoke. Bye, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye. Thank you.